Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, welcome. We're really looking forward to taking you through this session. So this is actually the third masterclass that we've run. The last one was all about DISC and driving forces together and how to incorporate them into a really great debrief. I'm Sarah Turner, Managing Director of TTI Success Insights UK, for those of you who don't know me, and then Porig Berry, CEO of TTI Success Insights Ireland. And we're both really, really happy to be with you this afternoon. So to start out, um, we just wanted to show you and talk about the relationship between disc and behaviours and EQ. So most, if not all people on this session today will be accredited disc practitioners, at least. Um, some of you may also use driving forces. Some of you may already use the EQ tool too. But most of the UK network certainly use mostly DISC, which is great. DISC is a really great tool. But as you know, we're always, we always talk about this. It's just that surface level talks about the how. So a model that we like to use and we refer back to is response, trigger and impact, which is DISC. So where you see DF, that's driving forces and then EQ. And we talk about DISC and behaviors, as you know, look, that looks at the how, how do you do things, the style in which you do things. And um, we think of that as the response. Then we've got the trigger, which is driving forces. So for those of you who don't know, driving forces are all about the why. So you've got DISC, that's the how, driving forces, which is the why. Why do we do things? What propels us into action? And um, what gets us out of bed in the morning? You know, what, what, what gets us going and gets us engaged? So that's what we talk about trigger and trigger is possibly a little bit more relevant to conflict too. So in certain situations, um, we might have conversations with people where somebody says something that is a trigger to our personal values and beliefs or our driving forces. And that is then a trigger for our emotional intelligence, which is the third area. And we call EQ, we, we refer to that as impact. So what's the impact that this that these behaviors will have upon ourselves and other people around us. So you can think of it as try if you want to, because that fits in with the Trimetrics EQ product, which is DISC, Motivators, Driving Forces and EQ combined. Um, but that's how we like to think about the relationship between the two. So think of DISC as your response. How do you respond to certain situations? How do you do things? Trigger, which is your driving forces, and then the impact that it will have upon you and other people around you depend upon your emotional intelligence levels. So those that's the kind of the relationship between them. And then um, you'll, the graphic on the left-hand side, again, you'll probably be familiar with this as accredited practitioners, but these are the different sciences that TTI Success Insights have available. Um, if it's got a star next to it, that means that there is a measurement for that particular science. If there is a triangle next to it, that means that we recognize that it contributes to superior performance, but we don't have a particular measurement available for it. And of course, the multivariate assessments that TTI Success Insights have are combinations of these different sciences together. But when it comes to EQ, um, the TTI Success Insights EQ model measures these particular five areas of EQ. So you'll see that there are some orange colored sections there and you'll see that there are some purple ones if the section is orange it means that it relates to self so you internally self and then if it's purple so the bottom two here you can see here the word others so that means that it's it's referring to others and then on the left hand side of this section here you've got awareness and regulation so awareness of emotions relating to self and others and then awareness of, and then regulation of emotions relating to self and others. And then you'll notice that motivation sits around the outside of these areas, okay? So motivation is defined as a passion to work for reasons that go beyond the external drive for knowledge, utility, surroundings, others, power, or methodologies. And so for those of you who, you who are familiar with driving forces, you'll recognize them as being the TCI Success Insights driving forces sections. Yeah, so knowledge, utility, surroundings, others, power and methodologies. So it's based on motivation is based on an internal drive or propensity to pursue goals with energy and persistence. 
Okay, so those are the kind of the key areas that are measured in a TTI Success Insights EQ assessment. We just want to talk about why is EQ essential for leadership development? So um, the TTI Success Insights EQ tool is based on Daniel Goleman's research and Daniel Goleman's model. And we would strongly recommend purchasing and reading the book that you can see there, Daniel Goleman, Emotional Intelligence. You should be able to see it here on the left-hand side of the page. And uh, since this will give you lots of information about the background research and the work into the EQ tool. Interestingly, the World Economic Forum has added emotional intelligence as one of the top 10 skills needed for success in the 2020s. And Goleman's research, which is the, obviously predates that, uh, proved that this was even more relevant for senior leaders. And his research showed that 90% of the difference between star performers and average performers in senior leadership positions is actually EQ. Actually, Porig, you have a really interesting way of explaining this, if you wouldn't mind talking our practitioners through that. Daniel Goleman did a talk to the Google senior leadership team in Google. And um, in that, he made a case, which I thought was, I've always thought was a really compelling, really, really strong, interesting case. And I want to draw it for you and see, do you agree or not with this? So let me just do this. He asked the question, what's the relationship do you think there is between IQ, like raw intellect, and emotional intelligence, or EQ? And what he said was, that this is really important because he said the soft skills have hard consequences, if you wish, or hard value. The soft skills, in fact, are the catalyst. They're what enable hard skills to be utilized effectively. And he said that these soft skills make people highly effective. And here's what he did. He said, yes, he said, in fact, when they look at a large population sample, this is what they got. They got a scatter graph. They didn't find there was no relationship per se between us. And then he did the following. He drew a circle and he said the following. He said, if you're looking at leadership at the top echelons, you know, a high performers, there's sort of a, a floor on IQ. I mean, if you're not smart, you won't be there at all. You won't be in the room. There's a floor in IQ. And he said there was a very small difference this difference here, very small difference between the top performer and the least good performer, if you wish, in terms of IQ. But there was a large difference on a unit base, was a large difference in EQ. And he thought that this was really, really important. And he gave a perfect example of this. He said that he was on a plane and he found that one of the people sitting beside him was a board member of the, the trustees of MIT. And he asked this board member you know, what they did, what the, the board did. And he said the primary purpose of the board was fundraising. And he said, interestingly, we did a piece of research on this. And what we found was that the biggest donors, the people who were able to give hundreds of millions of dollars in gifts to MIT, weren't the top people in terms of academically. They weren't the people who did best in college. There were people who were good enough to get into the, 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 the program and good enough to get out of the program. But there's some other skill set in the middle. They were the captains of teams, captains of varsities and so on. They had other skills that weren't pure IQ or academic skills that allowed them to be successful enough to build companies that were large enough to make the kind of contributions, the hundred million dollar contributions. So um, I think that's just a really, really interesting interesting comment and an interesting way to think about this because often when we look at EQ we think EQ ah yeah you know it's a soft skill and I know it's important but really and truly what really matters is can I do that job and can I do this can I do the other well he's our argument that's not the case in the top performers that's in fact not the case and when you look at the model and I'm just going to draw the uh, draw the the um, EQ model the Daniel Goldman model that we actually use when you look at this model you have at the core this concept of motivation, a sense of purpose, a sense of drive, a sense of purpose, um, some sense of meaning in your life. And then we, they draw the two axes and they talk about um, down the bottom awareness and the top action. And then they talk about self and others. 
And what the, what he, what he's arguing that this just like our model that you saw there that Sarah presented a few minutes ago, what he's saying is that there are four four core areas of which and motivation sort of is the foundation of it. It's some sort of intrinsic drive, some uh, sense of purpose. So we have self awareness, and then we have the ability to regulate. So am I aware of myself and can I regulate? Am I aware of others and can I regulate the interaction with others for a different outcome? And the key met the thing we're measuring here. And um, we're not measuring, for example, empathy. We're not measuring things. We're measuring, am I active in or are you active in self-awareness? Are you active in regulating yourself? Are you active in being aware of others and so on? Are you active in that area? So that's actually what we um, measure when we, um, when we use the EQ tool. But I want to talk about these five leadership competencies. So this program, the Complete Leader, is a program that we run. And in it, um, Ron Price of the Complete Leader, he argues that there's five core competencies, if you wish, for leaders. And he says they are uh, self-management, um, personal accountability, goal achievement, interpersonal skills, and the ability to persuade. Where does emotional intelligence play out in each one of these? Because if you're coaching, and if we're talking about doing a debrief or a coaching session with a leader where we're talking about behaviours, there's a great quote um, where it says, uh, I'm, the, um, what's it? I'm the expert of my intention and you're the expert on, on my impact or of my impact. So we all know what our intentions are, but how it actually impacts, how our behaviors actually affect. And uh, Sarah will be going through these one by one. Now, I show you D, I, S, and C and the effect of high and low EQ on them. Um, but in these five competencies, a person who's master self-management can work independently in order to pursue business objectives. So what does that mean in terms of um, um, skills, in terms of EQ? Well, I mean, simply put, I mean, you have to have an intrinsic motivation. Clearly, you have to be aware of yourself. If you can't demonstrate, if you can't control yourself, you have to be aware of yourself, you have to be able to control yourself, you have to be able to self-regulation. Um, otherwise, you can't. Somebody who's rushing around panicking, jumping from task to task, for example, is not going to inspire a lot of confidence. So self-awareness and self-regulation is key. If you look at the next one, uh, personal accountability, what does it mean? The ability to hold yourself responsible, to hold yourself accountable, to not make excuses. You know, emotions, when something goes wrong and we're challenged, we defend, we become a victim, we make excuses. Having emotional intelligence or being active in the area of self-awareness and self-regulation allows us to develop tactics so that we don't actually, so we can stack back, so we can't hold ourselves accountable, so we can accept things. And, and they say that to become an adult, truly, that the secrets and the best days of your life will be the days when you take full accountability for your actions. I think I'm actually quoting somebody there. I'm not exactly sure who said that. But again, think about this thing of um, personal accountability as being the key um, competency for leadership. And the foundation of that is emotional intelligence, the ability to actually be aware and to regulate so you can take feedback, so you cannot be a victim, so you can take responsibility. The next one uh, there is goal achievement. And this is really interesting because goal achievement is not about setting goals, it's about achieving goals. And uh, leadership is a challenge to be something more than average. <laughs> and I really like this because this requires self-management clearly. It also requires personal accountability. And it's made easier by other um, uh, ones such as flexibility and resilience. Again, these come from emotional intelligence. Uh, so that's sort of the foundation. So, Goal achievement is the, ultimately the result, I suppose, of being an effective leader, of leading yourself and then leading others. You can actually set and achieve meaningful goals. And interesting, <clears throat> one of the things I, I think is really important here is when you're thinking about goal achievement as a competency and the, the impact of EQ on it, think about intrinsic motivation. This, this, this drive to actually set and achieve goals, this sense of purpose. So I think this sort of comes a lot out of um, it, this it, it, internal motivation, this sense of purpose that Sarah ta ta talked about um, earlier on. Because every goal begins with a why. And then interpersonal skills, uh, the next one, um, we look at interpersonal skills. And I, I, I again, I'm not sure I need to uh, go through this in great detail. The ability to um, interact effectively with people, to empathize with people, to understand people is critical. 
And if you can't work and, and communicate with people, if you don't know how to listen to people, and I'm talking about actively listening to people, then you can't have strong interpersonal skills. We all like people who listen to us, who pay attention to us, who understand us. And I mean, we all know the quote about the great conversationalist, you know, um, and the, uh, the great conversation, of course, is the person who asks a good question and listens to his strong interpersonal skills and developing connections with others. So if you're looking for ways to build that skill, it's really about asking questions and listening, paying attention to people, empathizing or being genuinely concerned with, uh, with that person and their life and so on. And that's clearly uh, coming straight out of your EQ. And by the way, just to, to strengthen that, being part of mastermind groups and that kind of those kind of um, uh, forum, if you wish, um, are, is really helpful in that regard, because you learn to actually pay attention. You learn to open up in a, an environment that is, I suppose, relatively uh, safe for you. And the last one is persuasion. And again, I don't think I need to um, to go into great detail on that, but. If that's a top leadership company, one of the top five, the ability to persuade nobody to be a leader, you have to have followers. Nobody follows unless you can persuade. And by persuade, I mean that you have a vision, you have a sense of purpose, a sense of direction and the ability to communicate it to people in a way that they will understand. And so it's of value to them say, yeah, this is something that I actually want to follow. I think of Martin Luther King standing up, making his great speech. You know, I believe I have a dream. And a lot of other people said, yeah, I have a dream, too. I agree with you. I dream the same thing. So this ability to have a, have a vision and communication effectively to others is a top leadership competency. And again, you can develop those skills um, uh, by listening attentively by having a clear vision, by having a clear sense of direction and um, by learning how to communicate uh, effectively with people. So those are sort of my top five uh, competencies, Sarah. And um, I think for me, uh, when I'm coaching leaders uh, and I focus on these top five competencies for leadership skills, I always start with um, EQ. And I start to build the EQ model, take them to the EQ, and then ask them how it impacts on each one of these and how they can use EQ to help them become more effective in this in each of these areas. So as Poig mentioned, you know, we're, we're going to talk a little bit more about blending disc and behaviors with um low and high EQ, just to see how that how those different EQ levels will impact what we know of the, the disc and behavior styles. So You'll be familiar with this particular slide. Um, it's really an important part for leaders to be aware of, because just like driving forces, EQ levels almost give a sort of a context to the words on the scales for high and also for low. Um, like we talked about in the previous masterclass, just giving it that little bit of a, of a context, a feel, um, whilst we're thinking about the style, which, of course, as we know, is DISC. Um, and of course, when we're talking about the impact of high or low EQ on behaviours, there is that link with that ability to adapt. Um, and as Porig mentioned when he drew his diagram, that understanding of others is where you'll see adaption sort of playing out. I don't know about you, Porig, but that's one of the things I get asked the most about during accreditation sessions is, OK, my natural behavioural style and my adapted behavioural style are really similar to each other. Does that mean that I can't adapt because as a leader, I want to feel that I can adapt to other people? And of course, we always answer that with all that the assessments are showing us in the difference between the two is on your adapted style, the, the pattern that you most commonly show or the most commonly exhibit um, with your with your behaviors on a date. You know, it's not it's not about moment to moment because we all adapt all of the time. You know, on this session right now, sitting there, you are adapting because you're listening to myself and Porig talk. Um, but what we so it, so if you've got no difference between the natural and the adapted, it doesn't mean that you can't adapt. Um, it just means that probably you're not adapting on a on a day to day regular frequent basis, but you might be adapting from meeting to meeting, conversation to conversation. And where yeah. we really need really need to go to look at this is looking at your emotional intelligence levels because we'll see that that uh, that understanding if you like about the importance of adapting and about self-awareness and where our behaviors sit in the eq results so that's where you need to look to emotional intelligence to to answer that question the uh, think about it this way as well so 
when we talk about an adapted style, we're talking about your perception of how you need to behave to be to survive or to be successful in a given situation. And clearly, if you think about that, the fact that you're not adapting means you just don't perceive a need to change your behavior right now for whatever circumstance you're in. But when we talk about EQ, think about the idea of stretching and flexing. Uh, clearly, um, if, if I'm adapting to Sarah or she's adapting to me, if, if my EQ is, is high or low, that will impact on my ability to actually go to where she is, understand how she's behaving and not react inappropriately, manage the situation and so on. So EQ is like fundamental in your ability to actually stretch and flex to other people and other situations and it, without experiencing stress. It's probably the simplest way, because if you are trying to stretch and you don't have um, strong EQ, or you're not active in that area, you'll find it quite stressful, quite difficult to relate to that person. Absolutely. And so and, and I think if you imagine what a leader would look like. So I want you to think about what we know as being high D type behavior. Um, so imagine a leader who is driving, ambitious, pioneering, strong willed in their behaviors. So how they go about things. And they have no idea how their behaviors can be perceived by the people around them. And on top of this, they aren't able to recognize situations whereby they feel emotional and they aren't able to control those emotional responses either. If you think about what that might feel like working with somebody on a day to day basis, you know, what's the impact of that going to be on their colleagues? Um, and in times of high emotions, they might come across as angry or even potentially aggressive with that, um, you know, with a low EQ. And then I want you to imagine a leader who has the exact same behaviors. So high D behaviors, driving, ambitious, pioneering, et cetera. Um, but they have a keen awareness of how their behaviors can be perceived by people around them. And on top of this, they're able to recognize situations where they, when they feel emotional and they have good strategies in place to control these emotional responses. What's the impact of that going to be on their colleagues? Um, in times of high emotions, they may come across as assertive. So think about the, the difference in the word. I, I like to use this example with EQ, aggressive versus assertive. It's still telling us, it's still talking about high D behavior, but it's that difference between understanding emotional responses and being able to control them versus not. So actually people with high D with a high EQ may come across as assertive, level-headed, you know, great in a crisis. Same behaviors, different EQ levels. So, um, you know, and what you think about which would you prefer as a leader? <laughs> um, perhaps you've worked for somebody in the past with low EQ and high D behaviors. Um, and if you haven't, maybe think about how that would feel. Um, spoiler, I have, and it wasn't good. Um, yeah. Makes two of us, Sarah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, remember, I remember him throwing the folder across the room at me once. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's, I always think of it like this, Porg. It gives us great material for when we're doing sessions like this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So um, same same with the with the eye behavior. You know, I want you to imagine a leader who has a high eye and a low EQ. You know, in times of high emotion, they may come across as people may describe them as you know away with the fairies or overly emotional or overly optimistic, babbling or waffling, versus a high eye behavior with a high EQ who may be perceived as being very influential. And then on the opposite side of the scale, think about low eye behaviors with a low EQ. So people may perceive them um, as when they're leading the team as being very negative, very pessim pessimistic and kind of doomsday scenario um, people or you know behaviors. And then think about low eye behaviors with a high EQ. Okay, so those low eye behaviors that we're all familiar with, with a high EQ, they may come across as considered poised and strategic in their leadership. Um, and then so moving on to S, so we all know high S and low S, um, but just to recap on the screen there for you. So think about a leader who has high S behaviors with a low EQ. So in times of high emotions, they may come across as stubborn, unwilling to change versus a high S with a high EQ that will come across as consistent, reliable and a steady hand as a leader. And then think about a leader who has low S behaviors and low EQ in times of high emotions, they may come across as impulsive and unpredictable versus low S behavior with a high EQ who may be perceived as 
you know, creative or able to pivot to different situations when needed or able to spin lots of plates um, and, you know, and, and take on lots of different projects and be able to, to lend a hand to those different projects really well. And then finally, if we look at the C, high C and low C, again, you'll all be familiar with, with, with these behaviours. But, if, but thinking about a leader who has high C behaviours with low EQ, so in times of high emotions, people may perceive them as being, you know, pernickety or fussy or pedantic versus high C with high EQ coming across as having high standards and being accurate and being politically correct as a leader. And then on the opposite side, the low side, a leader who has low C and low EQ in times of high emotions may come across as a loose cannon or you know a bit of a maverick or maybe even a bit disrespectful um, or saying things that aren't politically correct um, versus low C behavior with high EQ, they may be perceived as revolutionary, creative, entrepreneurial or out of the box. So can you see how the EQ levels are, you know, sort of giving this, this context or an, a, a feeling about how those behaviours will be perceived to, to the behaviours? We're talking about the exact same behaviours, the style in which they do things, the way they handle problems and challenges, the way that, the way that they handle people, the way that they handle change and pace and the way that they handle um, rules and procedures that are set by others. Exact same behaviours but different levels of emotional intelligence, different levels of EQ being then the difference between a respected leader potentially versus not a not respected leader, you know, a disrespected leader. Um, I, EQ high and low. I think, Sarah, the, the, the little quote I gave earlier, I, you might know who says this. I don't know who actually said this, where it comes from, that I'm the expert of my intention. You're the expert of my impact. And, um, uh, that is the key, isn't it, to what you're saying here? That's really all about impact. And when we look at behaviors and indeed driving forces as well, because they have a direct relationship with EQ as well. When we look at the, how they actually play out, the key uh, for leadership is that they play out in the context of strong EQ, i.e. that you're active in the areas of self-awareness, self-regulation, social awareness and social regulation. But that's actually the key. That's the foundation to it all, isn't it? Absolutely. Yep, absolutely. Great. So hopefully that's um, been helpful to get you thinking about DISC and behaviours com combined with EQ and, and how that might help leaders. Um, and then we thought it, that it would be really useful to show you the sort of the bones of a great leadership session where you're using DISC and behaviours and emotional intelligence together as the foundational theories I think whenever anybody approaches me, and I'm sure it's the same for you, Porig, but let us know. And they ask, you know, I'm, I'm running a session for leaders or, or one of my clients has come to me and they um, are having issues with leadership. What tools should I use? The answer is always emotional intelligence, EQ first, and then behaviors second. So the two together, and if you can use driving forces as well, amazing, but behaviors and emotional intelligence together, um, you know, really are that, that the foundation of a great session. Is it the same for you, Porig? Yeah, abs abs absolutely. In fact, it's interesting. We had a, I had a conversation with some colleagues just a couple of days ago about this. Uh, Kieran was one of them. And we were talking about what comes first in a debrief, actually, and what would the order be? And I said, we're using trimetric EQ, which we use a lot, behaviours, driving force and EQ. And we will often start with um, uh, somebody's um, uh, why, go to their EQ and then talk about the impact, talk about the how, how they actually interact with the world and what people experience of them, which is all, and again, just to make the point, I think that one of the biggest challenges uh, leaders have is they don't get feedback. And because they don't get feedback, they're not actually aware. And they get out of the habit of practicing self-awareness and self-regulation because people aren't telling them, do you know, this is how you impact me. And whereas they're telling everybody else the impact they're having, they're not getting that feedback. So I think that order, anyway, I think the driving force is very important. I like that a lot, Sarah, and talking about like, why do you do what you do? And then talk about the EQ and how do you actually engage with the world and then behaviors, how would that play out in terms of uh, what people would experience with you? Yeah, great. Um, so th this is basically essentially how we, we would recommend setting up a great leadership session um, using behaviors and emotional intelligence. Now, this session could be modular. Um, 
it, it could be a full day session um, where you, what, you're approaching each different area um, during one day. Um, or actually even some of our clients record certain sections and then do face-to-face -face or virtual learning um, you know, after the event. So for example, um, some of our clients, they'll record or send videos out um, taking people through the foundational points of behavior, you know, or taking people through the, the, the theology of EQ. And then, then when they join the session, it's more about the and what do we do with this or, or, the, or the specifics about people's profiles. Um, but essentially, at some point, hitting on each of these different um, modules or, or areas will make a great um, leadership session. So um, the first area is obviously self-awareness, understanding yourself as a leader uh, via the assessments. That's always the starting point. And you do that, of course, with a TTI Success Insights DISC profile and EQ profile. As I said before, everybody has seen the TTI Success Insights DISC profiles, so you'll be aware that you know, you're reading through those general characteristics at the beginning, and everybody says, whoa how on earth does this assessment know this about me that's actually quite scary um and of course of course that's the magic of of the tool um but that obviously helps people's self-awareness helps them to understand where their behaviors sit and um, how they be how they uh, behave how they act and um, how they're going to um, lead essentially and then also the eq assessment to understand those different areas of emotional intelligence so the first part of any of this is understanding self first and you need that to then to lead on to the next part which is understanding how you need to adapt to other people so the first part is all about self-awareness helping leaders understand their their unique behaviors helping them to understand their eq levels and then leading on to adapting to others and that's all about of course understanding ways or or key things to do to adapt to your team members most effectively and I think it's really interesting um, when you um, talk to people about this. Um, I don't know if you've ever had in your sessions, this is an open question to the network, um, somebody say, OK, yeah, I understand who I am and I'm happy with that. I'm comfortable with that. Why should I change? Mm. You know, who says I should change? Who, sh who says that I should adapt to other people? They should be adapting to me. And um I often get asked by our network, how do I handle that that question? And I, I think that's the most difficult question <laughs> that you will get asked during a session because the obvious answer to that is, well, if you have high levels of EQ, you'll understand the answer, <laughs> you'll want to change. And that's where, of course, that motivation comes into it that sits around the outside of the EQ um, sections of the EQ, EQ graph and the EQ wheel. Um, that's where that fits in because when you need to then understand how to link it to people's personal goals and understand how to link it to their, maybe even their driving forces to help them understand, you know, the importance of adapting to other people. But luckily most people come to the sessions um, understanding why it's so important to adapt to other people and, and also wanting to, uh, to make that difference as a leader. So um, understanding those key ways, uh, you can obviously take them through that. You'll use the TCI Success Insights DISC profile science for that, you know, helping people understand if you've got high D behavior and you're working closely with someone who's got a low D behavior, what are some key strategies, what are some key things that you can do to communicate most effectively with that particular individual. But also if we're talking about leadership, these people who are um, working with their teams, it's, I think it's really interesting to um, help people understand what culture, what cultures exist within their teams. You know, is there a, a an, what we call an overpopulation of a particular behavior in this leader's team? You know, and, and obviously you can achieve that. You can understand that by looking at a TTI Success Insights wheel and plotting all of the team members onto that wheel. And then having that 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 sort of deep dive into looking as to whether there are any clusters of particular behaviors. You know, let's say, for example, in a certain team, um, there are 85 percent of the team have some form of high eye behavior um, in their in their graphs. 
on a wheel, of course, you'll see a big cluster of those people plotted around that I section. So does the leader even understand that? Have they looked into um, whether there are any behavioral cultures within their team? And if, if so, let's say, for example, you know, the majority have that I behavior in there, you know, what, what strategies do they have to, to, to manage that and to, um, to, you know, to accommodate for that? For example, when you have virtual team meetings, could you schedule some extra time onto those online sessions for some personal communication? You know, maybe you say the, the meeting, the business element of the meeting starts at 1230, but we'll be opening up the room at 1220 so that you can drop in and have a chat, have a conversation, talk about things that aren't necessarily related to that. But then 1230 comes along and we start and we talk about um, what we've what's on the agenda. And therefore, as a as a leader, you're kind of making that space for that personal communication and adapting the whole team. So not just yourself, but, you know, helping the whole team um, with certain strategies. So um, the, then the, the next part is understanding energy. So this is where you'll use the TTI Success Insights EQ science. And this is all about, of course, understanding um, some key strategies um, to be aware of people's energy and their resilience levels, um, you know, and, and understanding what happens when people are in that amygdala hijack zone. You know, the upper cortex is completely shortcutted and that capa capacity, that ability to think logically um, is completely shortcut. And so in those times, because because, of course, it's inevitable that you know, as teams, you will go through those those times. Um, what, what strategies as leaders have we got in place to manage that and to help people through that? Um, you know, do the leaders understand? Um, for example, you, you could use a battery bank analogy. This is what we use within our own team, where you're able to communicate what battery bank level you're on. Um, you know, think about a, a mobile phone. We talk about sometimes this with, with when you've been adapting your behavior over long periods of time, and it works in terms of that energy too. But thinking about, am I able to say to, some, to, to, to my leader, I'm currently only on 20%. And the leader understanding that that means in terms of out of 100%, I've only got 20% energy in the tank. It's going to be really difficult for that person who's only got 20% in the tank it's going to be really difficult for them to adapt, okay, because that's going to take up more energy. And of course, as we know, that takes away from your battery bank. So thinking about that ability to articulate in that language, saying, you know, I've only got 2020, everybody says communication is 50-50. And I honestly don't believe that. I think I think we need to bust that myth because as a leader, if your employee only has that 20% in the tank, um, you know, you need to then be able to adapt further. You know, you need to be the person that takes that adaption um, on board and adapts more towards that individual. No one's saying that, that leaders should be adapting all of the time to every single situation, every single meeting that they have. You know, it's really difficult if you've, if you've just had a, a session and you're working with someone that's completely different to you behaviorally. It's really difficult if then your next session is also with somebody who's really, who's really different to you behaviorally because you're essentially managing your own diary to make sure that you're adapting all the way through the day. So it should be, um, you know, a, a joint responsibility from leaders to their employees. But sometimes if your employee is saying to you, I'm on, I'm on 20%, that's a language that's a kind of a, almost a secret code for them to say, I'm going to need a little bit more help. But also it's a cue to say, if I respond in a certain way, you know, perhaps I'm a little bit short or, um, you know, I say something that's, that's that doesn't come out in the way that it's intended, then everybody around them knows that's not about me. <laughs> you know, that's about them and the fact that they don't have that ability to, to adapt. Um, they're only on 20 percent. They're in or they're in that amygdala hijack kind of um, arena. And so um that's really important that there's a communication, there's a language in the in the in the team, um, so that people can communicate that. And actually, just to just to be, just to share really personally, it's something that can be used in your personal relationships too. Um, you know, it's something that my husband and I, you know, we we have that language between each other. If I get home from quite a you know a energy zapping, if you like, day, I'm able to to say to my husband, you know. 
I'm only on 10% today. And because his behavior is totally different to mine, you know, pulls apart. And he understands that what that means is I'm not probably able to adapt as much as I should slash, you know, (laughs) I could uh, do. And so the same with him, he's then able to say, well, you're in luck because I'm I've got 90 percent in there and we know that we're going to be we're going to you know we're going to be able to adapt between each other okay um however if I get home and say you know I've only got 10 percent in the tank he also has had quite an intense day and has also only got 10 percent in the tank we need to then think about some strategies that we can adapt we can adopt to be to be kind to each other and to make sure that we don't you know have crosswords and to be totally frank so you know you can introduce that language in personal relationships too but it's it's about using that science using that understanding of emotional intelligence what happens when we're in that amygdala hijack what happens when we've been adapting all day and being able to introduce this this um, language into the team um, so that people can can communicate that to each other and then finally the action plan so you know what now and I think that's the most important part, really, of of, um, of the whole session. Always end with an action plan. Always end with a plan, because what that does is it stops um, this kind of wow, that was amazing. We had a great session. I learned so much. But then, anyway, back to back to real life. You know, back to the real world, and, and off they go, and, and basically forget everything that's that's been said during the session. So the action plan ending on that, and that. So what does this mean for us as a team? What's what things can we actually implement? How do we know it's going well? How do we know if it's not going well? And also, it's important to reflect on how do we know when when it has worked and when it hasn't. You know, and um, to be able to to record that. So the importance of cadence. And that regularity of check-ins um, and as a leader as well, being authentic and being vulnerable to times when it hasn't gone well, you know, times when you as a leader have been, a, haven't possibly, you know, been as emotionally intelligent as you would like to have been, or when you haven't adapted to others in the way that you would have liked to. Um, you know, one of the major themes of uh, competencies that strong leaders exhibit, according to a study by Harvard Business Review, um, which consisted of 195 leaders, was um, promoting connection and belonging among employees. And the way that leaders can do that is and encourage this is by being authentic and showing their own vulnerability and um, leading by example and, and being open with with times when they've experienced those emotional events and being open about their emotional states and the way that their approach um, to those situations. So I think as as consultants, trainers, coaches, when we're running these sessions, it's really important that we encourage the leaders to be authentic and, and to show that vulnerability and to check in on times when could have been be, it could have been better. So um, I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Porig, at all. Yeah, no, I think that was wonderful, uh, Sarah. Um... I particularly like your what's in the bank, the percentage in the bank. I think it's very, very powerful. I'd make a couple of quick comments. Um, The first one is um, on the self-awareness, self-perception. The case about the top five leadership competencies, I think it's important when you're communicating with leaders that they understand that while they may be an effective leader, they can be more effective. And superior performance is really about as, as we said in one of them, it's not about setting small goals, it's about setting big goals, it's about doing big things and achieving them. So I think it's important uh, at the beginning that they understand that. I mean, when we talk about um, leadership development, what are we talking about ultimately? The unpackaging of this understanding, be it behaviours, driving forces, EQ, we're unpackaging this so people become self-aware and in that have the capacity to actually adapt more easily. Uh, So adapting to others, a natural sequence or a natural follow on from this. And I think it's really, really important. I mean, talk about strategies and really important to understand simple things like reflection, like journaling, like taking a breath, like going for a walk. Um, And there's very, very simple things that one can do to improve one's capacity to adapt and to recharge one's battery. And we all have different ways to recharge our batteries um, and to build um, the various, the five elements of EQ, self-awareness, self-regulation, social awareness, and more intrinsic motivation, we can actually build those. And I want to make, I just really want to emphasize one point here. And because we haven't really said it, I think, um, 
EQ is, is a learned skill. Remember what we said at the very beginning, that EQ, when, we, when we're measuring an EQ, we're measuring, am I active in the following area of self-awareness or am I active in the area of self-regulation or social awareness or whatever? Am I active? It's not, you're not born with high EQ. And sometimes we look at people and say, oh, they were a born leader. Well, all it means is they learned the skills at a young age. These are skills that we can learn and everybody can develop and grow their EQ. And you do it by practicing. So, for example, if you're not very good at social awareness and social regulation, well, perhaps you, just, you, you, you ask questions and you listen attentively and you become and you genuinely listen to learn, first seek to understand. And, and, and so you can actually learn these skills and, and you can give um, um, leaders tactics, simple tactics. In fact, we have a workbook on it, don't we, Sarah, on simple tactics, 10 simple tactics for building uh, your emotional uh, intelligence. So I think it's really important. And uh, But I really like the energy one at the end. And lastly, on the action plan. And what I usually do, and again, Sarah and I were talking about this the other day, as we're going through a debrief with somebody, working through an exercise, I like to take notes um, on the margins of their report and, and keep and, and with them, like do it jointly, just take notes and say, what does that mean? What could we do about this? And start taking notes. So when you come to the end, there sort of is an action plan. There are practical things that have been noted as we went through the debrief that you can then say, okay, what can we focus on for the next week, two weeks, three weeks? And you focus on one or two things and then they move into action. So they bring it, they bring it back to the workplace with maybe one or two things to practice. Um, over the that period until you meet them again but nice model yeah. nice model yeah and and um and I think that's key you know at the end of the session agreeing times that that you're going to revisit this and, and revisit the action plan that that's really key you know making a commitment to saying when are we going to review whether this has gone well or not so well um and and also just on on that point Pori because you, you're absolutely right in that EQ is a is a constantly developing skill um I think the combination of emotional intelligence and behaviors um in a session because of that is is really powerful so as we know with behaviors in disc there's no there's no good and there's no bad you are who you are and actually everybody you'll probably notice that when, this when you run your sessions everybody's always thrilled with the results of their behavioral profile and um, because of course they are otherwise they wouldn't have that behavior so everybody loves their behavioral profile when they read through it and then when you come on to eq sometimes it is a little bit more hard hitting because this it is um, you are striving to have high levels of EQ, of course. Um, and so sometimes if, if somebody's report comes back and it's slightly, the EQ results are slightly lower, then having that kind of balance between the two where behavior is kind of, you know, is a, is a great starting point and is a great, um, you know, again, no right, no wrong. And everyone feels really great about it. And then it just kind of almost softens the, the EQ element a little bit. Um, so, so I think, and, and on that point about um, it being an, an ever growing skill, sometimes we get asked the question, you might find this when you're using this with people, people say, oh, you know, um, my scores are low compared to X person, but I don't think that they're very emotionally intelligent. And I think that I am. And we always say, don't think too much about the, the kind of the overall scores because this is a coaching report and therefore it has key things, key strategies in the report that you can do to develop your emotional intelligence further. Think about the relationship between the scores. So, um, you know, if your um, all of your scores are, let's say, you know, 60, and then your self-awareness is down at 30, then obviously that's the area that you're probably going to want to focus on a little bit more. So thinking about the scores in that kind of way of you know what's the difference between them and how do they differ from each other that will give you your kind of your first area for um focusing on that improvement um, Sarah, that, yeah. just quickly in the in the disc report your behaviors report there's a page called perceptions and uh, it's, it's always interesting when you uh, are doing your disc debrief a behavioral debrief with people and they come to the perceptions section and they go oh my god um, I think I'm charming and I think I'm this, that, the other, but people see me as being self-serving or whatever. And people usually get a shock. And that's where I like to bring in the conversation about um, intention and impact and say, yeah, I, we know this is 
what you intend. And we know that you don't mean to be this way, but this is what people experience. And how can you become more aware of that and, and better able to regulate it so you have a different impact? So you get actually the impact you want, because typically when people read that section, that is not what they want. Under mild stress and under extreme stress, they don't want to be that person and they don't want to behave like that. And uh, so I think that's 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 an important or a, a good opportunity to introduce us. Yeah, great. So if, if anyone's got any more questions, just drop them into the chat. Um, Kieran asked, um, what's the best area to start with to develop your EQ? Um, and my, my answer to that is is to actually under, take an assessment because um, the, the first part of it is self-awareness, you know, understanding where your emotional intelligence levels are. And to be honest, anytime we talk about emotional intelligence, even on this masterclass, technically you are improving your emotional intelligence and you're improving your EQ. Um, so, but taking an assessment is the first place to start, of course, and same for the leaders that you're working with. Self-awareness is the starting point. And you'll notice in the report itself, it gives really great suggestions of things that you can do to improve those different areas. So um, thank you so much, everybody. Unless you, you've got anything you want to add, Porig. No, I think that was excellent. I think a very good session. Um, uh, well done, uh, Sarah. You put most of it together. So a uh, very, very good session. Enjoyed it very much and happy to participate. Yeah, great. Thank you. So thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.